Hello and welcome to BMCC Online. We're so glad that you could join us today. Today we are uh, continue to work through our series called Questions. This is a series where we have taken questions from you online and from also members of the congregation that they may struggle with. Today, Jim is going to look at the question of how do we talk to our children and give them answers that are just not, hey, this is bad. No, you can't do this. You just shouldn't do that. Kids require from us sometimes a little more explanation, and especially when it comes to situations that they're hearing about at school on a regular basis. Uh, some of the topics for today's conversation is going to be, how do we an answer, is transgender bad, is gay bad? It how do we handle those conversations from a biblical standpoint? And how do we talk to our kids about that? Please join us as Jim dives into that question today. Thank you so much for being here. You make this rather snappy, won't you? I have some very heavy thinking to do before 10 o'clock. Good morning. What a beautiful day to gather to uh, look at uh, some of the questions that you've asked. And we're kind of bringing this, this train into the station with this uh, question series. But today somebody asked a question, well, a, a few weeks ago they asked it, and I've been trying to avoid it because it's pretty touchy. And, and as I go there today, uh, if you think we have protesters now, uh, <laughs> Today's topic might really bring them in, um, and I laugh, <laughs> and though I don't think it's funny, um, but the temptation is to sometimes avoid some of the harder topics, um, but today we're going to look at this question. The question is this, how do you teach your kids about homosexuality and transgender issues without just saying, that is bad? How do you teach your kids? You know, we're growing up, in, or they're, they're growing up in a world where, where that is the subject matter that they're seeing and hearing all the time, all, all over and all around them all the time. Um, one distinctive in the first century church was this. The first century church was known for the fact that they viewed sexuality very differently than the cultures that they found themselves in. The cultures that the, the church, it, it basically was springing up in this culture and springing up in that one and, and over here and over there. And as, as the church sprung up, they practiced a very different and even strange sexual practices compared to the culture that it found itself in. See, the Christians viewed sex as precious, as sacred, as something that, that isn't just to be thrown around, but it's something that is precious and is to be set aside for marriage between a man and a woman. And so that is the context, that is the historical uh, idea, that is, that is the people that we have come from and that's been passed down to us over the centuries and, and millennia. And like the first century Christians, uh, we today find ourselves in a, in a culture where that value system is not the norm in our, value, in our, in our culture anymore. Uh, and so here we are in this culture. Um, how do we teach a healthy, traditional Christian sexual ethic in a world that, uh, that thinks very, very differently than we do? How do we teach this ethic in this culture today and it does no good, really, to condemn the culture. For me to stand and point fingers and, and condemn people out there who think very, very differently about human sexuality than I do or than the church teaches. How do we engage in that conversation with grace, with love, with compassion, and yet cling to what is a, a healthy, traditional Christian sexual ethic. Um, it doesn't mean we reject people because they think differently than we do. It doesn't mean that. I'll keep it G-rated. Some of you are you're a little nervous right now. <laughs> it's going to be G-rated, I promise. G-rated 
message. Oh, and um, if you're watching online, I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff. And if you want this simple, simple answer, skip all the stuff and go to the end of the sermon. All right? The rest of you, you're going to have to sit through it. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, the deal is this, though. Humans have struggled with sexuality our entire existence. As a species, as a race, we have always struggled with this. You can see it in our history. We can see it in the scriptures. We can see it in our streets. We can see it in our schools. We can see it in our churches. We can see it in our families. And sometimes we might even look in the mirror and see it. Now, what are you talking about there? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. I mean, sexuality, it's a complicated thing, and we've struggled with it, and it seems like it should be easy, but it's not. Historically speaking, it's, it's something the humanity has, has struggled with all along. I read a headline the other day that said, the United Methodist Church is less united than ever. The headline has to do with the fact that there is a schism in the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church as a denomination has decided that they're going to move away, in America anyway, they're going to move away from their stance on homosexual marriage and uh, having self-avowed practicing homosexuals as clergy. And so some churches have said, you know what? That's not the Methodist church that we knew. And so we're going we're gonna to break away from that because we can't, that's not what we see here. And so there's this, Thousands of churches have left United Methodism because of that or are in the process right now of leaving. And they're not the first group of Christians to have gone through that. The Lutherans went through that a few years ago. The Presbyterians went through that a few years ago. The Episcopal Church went through that a few years ago. Why? Because sexuality is a difficult thing for us. And we're trying to navigate this with compassion and grace and yet here we are. <laughs> They're not the only ones. Oh, even the Catholic Church is having discussions right now. You know, priests have been celibate, right? I mean, that's the deal. If you're a priest, you're celibate. Same with nuns. If you're a nun, you're celibate. Well, in the Catholic Church, just last week, the Pope is talking about potentially letting priests marry for the first time in a thousand years. In fact, the Pope said, if I got it right, the Pope said, that was a temporary decision <laughs> to not allow priests to marry. It was a temporary decision, and it, was, it really had to do with the fact that the priests, were, um, the priests were giving in their will, they were giving their wealth to uh, their family rather than to the church. And so, <laughs> a temporary, I mean, a thousand years, it doesn't seem temporary to me. But, uh, but there's, that's the discussion. We're trying to navigate this hard stuff, how do we do it? And churches are struggling with it. Have you ever seen somebody get something right for all the wrong reasons? Ever seen it? When I was in college, I took a course called finite math. And thinking, you know, there's really all these complicated maths, but finite math was story problems, right? They're, those are so easy, story problems. I'm gonna take finite math. It was so hard. <laughs> It was so hard, I, I should have never. But there was a, a test that I took that I got the right answer, but I didn't get any credit for the right answer because I'd done all the calculations. It was all wrong, except the answer was right. How do you do that? How do you get the right number at the end, but you got all the calculations wrong? I don't know, I did it. And I got no credit for the answer that I gave. In some ways, I think, that's where we are as a culture. And I'm not here to bag on our culture, but I think in some ways our culture wants to be compassionate and gracious and loving and accepting. I think that's what is under the idea of, of, of sexuality and, and, and our, what's being accepted today in our culture, but I don't think they're getting there by doing the math correctly. Let me explain that just a little bit more. And we're gonna oversimplify just like I always do. How do, you, how do you teach these issues to your children? Here's the deal. When it's an issue, it's easy to teach it. 
If it's just an issue, if, if I'm trying to teach an issue to my kids, it's just an issue. But the problem is these issues have names. These issues have addresses. These issues are people that we know, that we interact with. These are people that we love. So how can we address this more than just an issue, but instead as a people, as one person addressing other people? How do we do that? And so we come to our text for the day, or at least one of them. Genesis 5, 1. This is the written account of the descendants of Adam. When God created human beings, he made them to be like himself. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and called them human. First of all, the first part of that text tells us this. You and I, we humans, we are made in the image of the divine. You are made in the image of the living God. That's heavy <laughs> when you think about it. You have, every human being on planet Earth has a divine spark in them, a reflection of the face of God in them. Everybody does. Now, <laughs> That doesn't mean you're God or that you'll ever become a God, but it means that there's something in you that reflects the very image of the divine. You are made in the image of God on first. And then secondarily, God gave them genders. And the gender he gave you is a blessing. It's a blessing that you were made the way you were. So if you're a male, you're blessed by that because that is a reflection of part of who God is. If you're a female, that is a blessing because it's a reflection of part of the nature of God. Are you saying God's a woman? No. Are you saying God's a man? No. No, neither. Are you saying God has female and male body parts? No. Nothing like that. But part of who God is is reflected in a woman. And part of who God is is reflected in a man. And when you put them together, you get us. <laughs> you get us. We're a mess, aren't we? I mean, in some ways, right? We're kind of a mess. And this issue of sexuality, oh, there's an issue again. It's frustrating and it's confusing and, and it's filled with shame sometimes. How do we navigate it? Humans, and here's a part, part of it, At our gender impacts so much of the way we experience life. I mean, a man experiences life very differently than a, than a woman. It's just, just different. And, and it's the way we see life. It's the way we experience life. It's, it's the way we, we go through life. I mean, our gender impacts so much of that. But first of all, beyond your gender, you are human. You're human. You're made in the very image of God, in the image of the divine. So if you're male and you kill somebody, you're guilty of murder. If you're female and you kill somebody, you're guilty of murder. Now, what if you murder a woman? It's still murder. What if you murdered a man? It's still murder. It's, it's human. And, and you would today get the same sentence for murdering one person as another. Because you've taken the life of a human, something sacred, and you've extinguished it. But so much of the way we see life is seen through the fact, the lens of our gender. Now, the same can be said for your race, right? I mean, so much of the way that you experience life comes through the lens of the race that you were born as. It just does. We're all human, and yet we're born sometimes different colors or, or different genetic makeup or all of that stuff, and yet we're all human. Anytime and every time we have tried to dehumanize another person, another race, anytime and every time we have tried to dehumanize another person, we've paid a horrible price for it every time, every time. 
How do you own a slave? Well, how do you, here's how you own a slave. You have to dehumanize that other person to own them. You have to dehumanize them and think of them as less. You have to dehumanize other people to do some of the awful things we've done to people. If we're going to kill somebody who's our enemy, we have to dehumanize them first because we can't kill somebody who's the same as me. I have to find a way to think of them very differently, dehumanize them. We pay an awful, awful price when we dehumanize somebody else. To dehumanize somebody is is to look at an image bearer of God, an image bearer, and say, I deny the image within you. I look at you, and if I don't, and I deny that the image of God exists in you. That's an awful thing for us to do. Now, some people have lived such selfish, horrible lives. They're, They're vile, and they're filled with hatred and lies and delusion, that they have allowed themselves to be slowly remade, not in the image of God, but more in the image of Satan, the father of lies, all right? And so some people around us look less like God than other people. They're being remade in the image of Satan instead. And yet, the image of God remains in every human, every human, no matter what you do. And for us to deny that image is something we call sin. (laughs) Sinful. What do we do in terms of race? Um, In race, we break it down into skin tones, right? Into genetic heritage. We break it down into all kinds of things. And and those are kind of human hang-ups. I walk into a room, and so do you. We all do. This is a cultural thing. You walk into a room, and you look around, and you look, like, you look for somebody who you can relate to, somebody who understands your life just a little bit. And it might be their skin color is the same as yours. It might be, do they seem like they have the same education level? Do they seem like they're the same? Um, I'm always lo- we, as humans, we're always looking for somebody who knows a little bit of our story so we can kind of walk over and connect to them because they feel a little bit safe to us. Those are human hang-ups. And we might fear and distrust people who don't look like us or who, who look so radically different than us that we're like, ah, I don't even know what to think about that person. But those are not God's design. God looks at us, and he calls us his children. You know what God doesn't do? God doesn't look at me and say, oh, there's Jim, my little white man. He doesn't do that. He, do- he looks at me and says, there's my child. And he looks at you and says the same thing. And so God looks at us like that. But we struggle to look at each other like that. I'm going to be a little bit cautious here because there have been times in my life when I have been profoundly insensitive, profoundly insensitive. Name the issue. (laughs) Race, gender, all that stuff. There have been times when I have said awful things, and and those are really, as I reflect on them, those are some of my most um, regretful moments in life. I have dehumanized people based on, on name it, I have, <laughs> and it's not good. I have looked into the eyes of an image bearer of God and denied the image that was in them. And that's not okay. Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 36, Jesus said, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. You have to be. You must be compassionate. There was a moment in time when Jesus was in Samaria, and the people in Samaria were rejecting Jesus and rejecting his disciples. Actually, it's found in Luke. I don't have the passage here today, but it's found in Luke chapter 9. And and Jesus was being rejected in Samaria, and James and John were pretty offended by it, those dirty Samaritans, right? And, And James and John were like, Jesus, let us call down fire from heaven and burn them up. And Jesus rebuked them. (laughs) 
How many times have I wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn them up? A bunch. <laughs> kind of recently. <laughs> but you must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. What does that even mean? Somebody is strange and they don't look like you. Somebody thinks very differently than you. Somebody is rejecting you. Somebody is treating you badly. Somebody is calling you names or saying lies about you. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. The apostle Paul wrote these words. This is in Galatians chapter 3. Verse 27, 26, excuse me. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. So when we give our life to Christ, and and everybody else who's given their life to Christ, You're no longer, your racial makeup doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter now. In Christ, it doesn't matter. Neither slave nor free. Your station in life, if you're a millionaire or if you are looking for a job, it doesn't matter. Your station in life. Neither male or female. Your gender, in this case, in this case, Because of Christ, we're all all on equal footing. Your gender doesn't matter now between being male or female. On a grander level. (laughs) It doesn't mean you still don't see life through the eyes of a woman or life through the eyes of a man. It doesn't mean that at all. But but in terms of our value and and our relation and how Christ views us, our gender is is secondary. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God promises, promise to Abraham belongs to you. Okay, that is radical, radical thinking back in these days. This is first century. It, nobody thought like this in the first century. In the first century, if you were a woman, you were a lesser being. Sorry. But in the first century, you were not viewed equally to men. Men owned their wives. (laughs) Men were higher than men were the ones who... (laughs) This is radical stuff. And this faith comes along and elevates women to the place they should have always been, the place that that they were in the garden. They're, They're on the same level. He made them male and female equal. First century, it was, it was absurd to hear these words. <laughs> Slaves were the same as free, free people. <laughs> they were the same through Christ. They're the same. And, and so the church was the only place in the whole world where, where you would go and sit down, and there is a slave owner, and there's a slave on the same pew. All right, they didn't really sit on pews. But the, here they were, they gathered together to worship God, and, and it elevated them to a level where now I have to look you in the eye and recognize the divine spark in your eyes. It's a different way of thinking. Gender, <laughs> set that aside. It was so radical. So every person on earth, all of us, are image bearers of the divine. You carry in you the spark, the reflection, if you will, of God. And so everyone is worthy of dignity and respect and compassion and grace. But what if they say bad things to you? What if they mistreat you? Man, Jesus doesn't let us get away with that, does he? Jesus is like, you must be compassionate. (laughs) Somebody asked the question, where did it go? I had it just here. Somebody asked the question, how do we find the balance between standing up for your beliefs yet being a love first person? This is an easy question. 
How do we find the balance between standing up for your beliefs and being a love first person? Love first, and then when you stand up for your beliefs, <laughs> that falls in line. But you love first. You can stand up for your beliefs. That's fine. It's good. It's right. But if you don't do it out of love, well, you're probably doing it wrong. Love first, and then stand up. In the name of diversity, though, in the name of diversity, our culture seeks to recognize and celebrate but it also seeks to condemn anything that doesn't align with the narrative. In the name of diversity, celebrate and recognize. But if it doesn't align with the narrative, it rejects it. Do you know what doesn't rely, uh, align with the narrative of today's culture? The Christian faith. It doesn't. It doesn't align. It doesn't align <laughs> because we are saying, yes, we're all equal. We're all, we're all made in the image of God. We all carry this divine spark, but it's through Christ that we see this. So in some ways, I think our culture is trying. <laughs> I think they're trying to get there. They're trying to elevate all humans to the same level. But in doing that, they got the math wrong. They just did the math wrong. They got the right answer. Eh, close to the right answer, but they got the math wrong along the way. Celebrating people, granting them compassion, that's good. It really is. But remember, Jesus, <laughs> he says these words, these words that just ring, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. So real quick, Gender dysphoria, uh, transgender issue, people. What is gender dysphoria? It's where somebody who is a man might think they, they experience life as a woman and, and they relate to being a woman more. Or vice versa, somebody who's a woman who thinks they experience life more internally as a man. So how do they, how do they navigate all of that stuff? Kate Borenstein said this, Gender fluidity is the ability to freely and knowingly become one or many of limitless number of genders. For any length of time, at any rate of change, gender fluidity recognizes no borders or rules of gender. <laughs> any number of genders. Um, in some ways, that almost echoes what Paul says, right? Uh, almost. There's neither Jew or Greek Slave or free, male or female. Now that you belong to Christ, you're true children of God. But I'm afraid I don't trust Kate Bornstein <laughs> to get it right. I'm afraid I don't trust the message that our culture is telling us is truth. I'm afraid that, that the idea that there's this limitless number of genders, I'm afraid I don't believe that. And yet, uh, that idea that, that she's pushing is this. You get to pick the ending. You get to choose. You get to pick anything you want to pick. And, and whatever you pick is good. Now, as Christ followers, our calling, your calling, my calling, is to embrace people no matter where they are. That's our calling. Never dehumanize, ever and even as I say that, <laughs> I have to be careful. Never dehumanize another person. Now, there's a lot of theological stuff in terms of homosexuality and transgender, uh, that whole topic. There's a lot of theological stuff. I'd encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in kind of exploring the theology behind where the church can stand and, sh and really the theology behind the Christian perspective. I say the Christian. There are many, actually, Christian perspectives. But um, if you're interested in going down the theological rabbit hole, and there's a lot of good stuff, I would encourage you to go to centerforfaith.com, centerforfaith.com. And on centerforfaith.com, 
It's, it's Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, but it's centerforfaith.com. And you'll find books, you'll find podcasts, you'll find webinars, you'll find pastoral papers, you'll find academic research. You're going to find all kinds. You, you can spend the rest of your days pouring over all of these issues. And it's really fascinating. It really is. Um, or we have a book in our bookstore. <laughs> It's called Living in a Gray World. This, uh, it's a Christian teen's guide to understanding homosexuality, but it's also, it talks about the LGBTQ plus conversation. But it's in the bookstore. You don't have to be a teen to read it and get something good from it. You can be an adult. They're $10. <laughs> There's other great resources out there. Uh, but go to that if you want to go down the theological bunny hole. Is that a right word? Rabbit hole? How do you teach your children in this world, in this culture, where it feels like every time they turn on any kind of entertainment, they are being taught sexuality? Even little kids, they're being taught sexuality. How do you, as a mom, as a dad, how do you teach your child? Here's what I would do. For a boy or for a girl, I would tell them this. God made you just like you are. God made you, and you are perfect. God made you just as you are, and you are perfect. And God knew what he was doing, and he loves you so much, and I do too. That's what I'd tell them. That's that's what I'd tell them. And then you started the conversation. And stay in the conversation. Stay in it. Talk with them. Stay in it. How do you teach them? You just, you just stay in the conversation. They trust you. Your little kids, your little ones, they trust you. Now, when they get bigger, they don't trust you so much. But when they're little, they do trust you. And you lay a foundation in their lives. And, and the little truths that you drip into them every day, it matters. And it builds in, in next, I think it's next Sunday or maybe it's in two weeks, we have a, a baby dedication and I'm going to read a passage from in that dedication and, and the passage says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Something like that. <laughs> and it's true. As you teach your children, those things, they set the foundation in their lives. And sure, they might at some point reject everything you've ever taught them, but the foundation is still there. And and someday they might question and they might be learning other things from other sources and and there's other drips, (laughs) other drips that are coming into their lives too. Wow, is that figurative language or is that literal? I don't know. But there are other people, you're not the only one raising your kids, but your voice is the significant voice. And so pour into your children truth. They'll hear you. They might reject you. (laughs) They might turn away. But all you can do is just pour in yourself in truth. And then if they do reject you, (laughs) love them anyway. Love them anyway. Pray for them. It's all, we just have a moment of time in our kids' lives. So when our kid, it's funny, the little things that, that, that matter in a kid's life. Our, our kids, uh, our girls especially, well, really our girls, when they were getting ready to get on the school bus, we always prayed over them in the doorway of our house. And then the neighborhood kids started to gather at our house to wait for the school bus because it was right on the corner. And so we'd pray over the neighborhood kids too. So we'd pray over our kids or or, or our neighborhood kids. And really, Leslie did most of of that because she was home with them and getting them off to school. (laughs) But that laid a foundation in their lives. It's funny, the little things that that you do. So um, once when, when our oldest was very young, she tipped over some milk, and it spilled. <laughs> and she was very upset. She'd spilled her milk. And I told her, sometimes that happens. <laughs> sometimes that happens. 
And that became a thing. Anytime you dropped something and it broke or you spilled something and it, and it was a mess. And, and anytime you knocked your food off and it hits the ground, it's like, ah, we can get upset. But sometimes that happens. It's funny how a little phrase that has no theological backing to it. <laughs> it's funny how that silly little phrase took on a life of its own through all of our kids. And every once in a while, I'll still hear it, even now as the kids are older. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> I broke that. Well, sometimes it happens. You have the opportunity to pour into your kids, and what you tell them will last their entire lives, even after you're gone. Pour in everything you can. Pour truth, pour grace, pour compassion, pour love. And do it in the name of Jesus. If you call BMCC online, your home church, uh, we invite you to continue worship through the giving of your tithe. You can do this at bluemountainchurch.com. Uh, we're so grateful that you could be here today. We'll go ahead and leave you with this blessing. May you be compassionate just as your heavenly Father is compassionate. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the only hope this world has ever known. Have a great day.